and uh, of course being all fans, and he's going to stay away from straight from the Stones. Okay. Can you just raise your volume a bit? Yes, I can. How's that? Is that better? Yes. I all can. right, Barry. You want me to go first? Yeah. Bill, I've been Come a fan. Come on, Barry, been, be brave. I'm, I'm <laughs> brave. I'm brave. I'm brave. I, uh, I've just uh, finished reading a book that you may or may not have read, Keith's Life book. And uh, during the time in the mid-'70s when Keith describes it as a, sh a fallow time for the Stones, you did one of the, an album that became one of my favorites, Monkey Grip. And I was wondering, I know you want to talk about the Rhythm Kings and everything, but I just had this curiosity as to during this rather uh, tumultuous time for the Stones, what uh, what made you do that? And it's such a delightful album. It's, it's a very happy, it's not a dark album at all, it's a very happy album. And I yeah, thought... it, it did surprise a lot of um, people, um, musicians particularly in LA, when I played it to them all. I had a whole bunch of them come over when it was finished in the studio and um, played it and with David Bowie and various people like that, and they were all quite, quite surprised that I'd actually achieved it because I had lots of great musicians on it. That was the advantage of it. But the reason I did it was the frustration I always had of not being able to be involved in any of the um, Stones songwriting or arranging or mixing and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, it, it was very limited what you could do there. You know, with, you know we had Jimmy Miller there, of course, uh, our engineer and Mick and Keith like um, pretty much dominated so it, it left very little space for me and Mick Taylor to, to really get too involved apart from just playing on the tracks so I, I thought instead of getting frustrated as Mick Taylor did and eventually left a year later um, instead of getting uh, sort of really upset about it I just thought I'll go off on a tangent and do do something on my own so I did three albums um, over the next 10 years, and uh, I did a movie score, and I produced other bands, a band called Tucky Buzzard, who, who traveled through America quite a lot. And um, I satisfied that uh, frustration. Well, the uh, when I was reading over your bio, I also noticed that you had a lot of other things that you uh, did as diversions, archaeology, photography, Marc Chagall. I mean, you, you just hit all the bases. <laughs> Restaurant? Yeah, restaurant, yeah, yeah, sure. That, yeah. <laughs> so. Writing books. Oh, yeah, but I've always had lots of interest, you know. Even as a kid, you know, when I was growing up and when I joined the Beginnings of the Stones, being the fourth member to join before Charlie, um, I thought, as we all did, that uh, if we ever had a career in music, it would only be three years, if we were really lucky for, and talking oh. to the Beatles and the Who and everybody, the Animals... In, in those days when we were in the clubs just chatting and all that, we we were all always talking, oh, maybe if we're lucky it'll last another couple of years. So I always thought I could do all those things later, you know, after the career had folded, because very few bands lasted more than a few years in those days. Um, but then 30 years later, <laughs> I still haven't done them, you know, and I was getting very frustrated. I had achieved some things in the 70s, like um, I was uh, t doing photography, and stuff like that but um it was very limited what i could do and, and, and solo albums and all that because of the time you know i had to do things in bits and pieces in between stone stuff do you think that uh bass players in general like john entwistle yourself and a number of other people have taken the short shrift because of the the people in the front <laughs> uh, <you can. laughs> well we're all all bass players, or, or most bass players, are pretty quiet, aren't they? They don't. They, they do. Don't, yes. They don't push. They're not high egos, um, like your singers and your lead guitarists, etc. Um, and that applies to my great great mate Duck Dunn, who who's my idol Duck uh, from Dunn, the Booker right. T Band. Sure. You know? sure. Uh, and people like that. We we didn't push, you know. So Steve Krupper got all the songwriting with Otis Red, didn't he? And all that. Duck got sure. nothing really, although he was there just as much. And the same applied to the Stones. You know, that's that's the way it was, and you just lived with it. Well, I want you to know that I'm very honored to be talking to you. I've been a Stones fan since 1964. I mean, you know. Oh, bloody. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a little, I'm, I'm not quite as old as uh, some people think I am, but I am old enough to know what went on back then. <laughs> and uh, I've done a lot of studying about the group, about you, 
And I've, I'm deeply, deeply humbled to be able to talk to you. I'm going to turn it over to Bob now, who is going to talk about the Rhythm Kings. And, and you just have yourself a swell day, okay? That's very fair. Very nice of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Bye-bye. All right, Bye. Bill. Thank you, Barry. All right, Bill. Yeah. We've got a five-CD new box set, collector's edition of your Rhythm Kings work. How did this all come about to be compiled this way? Yeah, well, we're, we're very well known in Europe, you know, Scandinavia right over to like uh, Eastern Europe uh, and various other countries. But we haven't really been um, promoted in America. Okay. Uh, and, and in bits and pieces, you know, that we do have fans over there that follow us. In fact, a few years ago, 30, uh, no, 300 American fans uh, chartered a plane huh. and flew over to London to come to one of our gigs there in South go. London. 300 of them, and that was quite fantastic. Oh, sure. um, but it's it's few and far between. We have a, a odd American people coming to our shows that fly over, you know, and all that. But it it was like a uh, how how can I put it? Uh, like a, a market that hadn't been broken into. So um, uh, I got together with this new record company, uh, Proper Records, and they Amazing. they suggested this, and I thought, yeah, well, let's go for it because uh, we're not known really in America, and we're getting great great feedback from from the um, critics and uh, reviewers at the moment so i'm very pleased Deservedly because so. it is a great band we do it do is. great covers you know and they are high quality no and, and we've got great singers and uh, and uh, musicians there that just make it a, such a dream to do you know for me it, otherwise i wouldn't do it. Ah, it i'm sure but your selection that's one of the things i wanted to talk about of, of musicians you've used on, over the all over these over these albums has been you know very high quality and, and i have to add some of my favorite players, I mean, and singers. You know, no, when you start using guys like Georgie Fame and Albert Lee, these are not really, you know, top-tier names in the industry, but people with musician-type ears, and I don't play, uh, know that these, these are not white Oh, people. they're highly rated yeah. by my musicians. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. exactly. And that's, that's, I mean, for me, I've always been a guy that, you know, grew up and listening to a lot of the Blue Note records and the Atlantic records and the Stax records, as you mentioned, often. Yeah. And I always looked to see who the sidemen were. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And your sidemen are of uh, high, 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 high quality. <laughs> and then, of course, once in a while when, when there's a track and I think it needs something that we, we haven't put on it, or Albert might be back in America on tour, or Georgie right. Fame might be in Australia with a, a big jazz band, as he does, or Europe... Um, I sort of search around, and I think, oh, God, um, maybe Eric Clapton would do, <laughs> do it. So, Nothing wrong so with that. So you phone Eric up and ask him, and he does a couple of tracks for you. And then I, I speak to Mark Knopfler a year later and, 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 and say, can you do one for us, Mark? And he yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can do that, but obviously we can't take him on the road. But no. um, just as a special guest to, to do a little cameo part on an album is possible with Chris Rea uh, and everybody else. Paul Jeez. Carrick sang on a few songs. Maybe you don't know these names, but oh, um, they're well known in England and Europe. So um, it's nice to have them on. And then, of course, Peter Frampton, my right. old mate, and yeah. uh, and then and, and then I asked George Harrison, you know, just before he died, if he would like to do something, you know. And he said, Bill, why are you asking me? You've got two of the best guitarists in the world in your <laughs> band, which was Albert Lee and Martin Taylor, the wonderful sure. jazz guitarist, wonderful player, who's been top jazz guitarist in England for like 20 years, played with Stefan Grappelli and everyone. He's absolutely stunning. And I said, yeah, George, but I want you on it, you know. And he says, well, I can only play one note. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, but George, that is the note I want. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so he did it, bless him, you know, and, um, and, it, and he did a very nice job on it. And then I sent him one of my books as a thank you, my Chagall book, the limited okay. edition book as a thank you. And he wrote me a beautiful letter back, and uh, it was sweet. So when he died the following year, we did Taxman, uh, on tour and on record as a tribute to him, to, as a thank you, really. I remember the Taxman track, yes, very but well. But it's nice to do those things, you know. Um, <clears throat> we're very open like that, so once in a while someone will come up on stage with us, but uh, it's few and far between, you know. He was another guy caught in a trap, sort of like you were, as far as, you know, being... He couldn't get through the McCartney and Lennon thing, right, as far as writing, writing something. Yeah. You know, same deal. Yeah, well, I saw Ringo last week, actually. Oh, Ringo, okay. Yeah, because I went. We went. We were invited to the um, George Harrison um, movie. You know the right Scorsese thing. Okay, and it was absolutely brilliant. So everyone was there. You know, but, but George McCartney had and all the Monty Python guys and and lots of musos. 
and it was great to be there. So oh, it was I good bet. to see um, Ringo. He's very well, and we were talking music, actually. Good. He said he brought his band over to Europe last year and had a ball, you know, and, and I said, yeah. He well, hires a nice band, too, Bill. What? He hires a pretty good band, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he always yeah. has some I good players. I think the only difference is when he hires a band, bless him, and he has used people that I've used. He's used Peter Frampton. He's right. used Gary Brooker, yep. who was in my band, and um, various people like that. Um, he has them do their hits. Right. Uh, if he has Dr. John, right. then it, he'll do Right Place, Wrong Time, you of know, course. and all that. Um, and we don't do that. Right. I know. Oh, everybody plays Rhythm Kings music, which is just a mixture of roots music. It goes back from the 20s to the 70s. J.J. Kale, uh, Fats Waller, yep. you know. You name it, we do it. Um, Joe so Turner. We, we have our own sort of identity as a band rather than a lot of celebs coming on and doing their hits, is the which only, is what Ringo does. Is, I, he even asked true. me once to be in the band ah. and do a tour of America with him. Okay. But you're and not I said, I'm that. in the band. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but we're close friends. That's good. That is good. And McCartney's getting married, right? And I heard Ringo was attending the, uh, the wedding. As yeah, and quite a few other people. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, yeah, no, I mean, it's of, of living Beatles, obviously. Yeah, he, he was he was married in London. Yeah, I didn't, we didn't go, but um, I've kind of lost touch with Paul over the years, but um, I'm still quite close to Ringo. But Harrison had similar frustrations as with when All Things Must Pass came out. We heard all these wonderful songs that he, he's been had been collecting, I guess, for many years, and oh, yeah. when he couldn't get them published and 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 written and and put out by the Beatles. Well, it's kind of hard when you're in a band, you know. Um, you know, Mick Taylor was very creative. I sure. was hopefully very creative. I thought anyway. And um, when you can't do those things in the band you're in, it, it's a nightmare, really. I'm sure. Because you're doing an album every eighteen months, right? And there's only ten songs on it, hmm. you know. And 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 you're doing a, an album every three years or something, or every two years. So, you know, the 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 people that write the songs, namely um, Lennon McCartney or Jagger Richard or you name right. anybody else, have got a whole stack of uh, stuff they've put together over those two or three years to record. So there's no room. And, and I had to appreciate that, and sadly, and think, well, I don't write that kind of music anyway, so fair enough, I'll do something else with it. As an artist, though, it has to be very frustrating. As yeah. a creative artist, as you say. Yeah, it was, but then, I, of course, I... I got over it because in the 80s I, I created a band called Willie and the Poor Boys yep. with um, a whole bunch of celebrities. It was a bit like the forerunners of the Rhythm Kings, actually. And we did Roots music, and Ringo was on that, actually. He That's was right. on as a guest on the, on the video. And um, th that was a lot of fun to do, you know. I, I only do these things because they're enjoyable. If they weren't, I would, I would not do it because I've got like eight projects going at the same time all, all the time. You know, I've got books, I've got the restaurant, I do archaeology, I do astronomy, <laughs> I open events at museums, uh, I do charity, sport, um, I've got a big website. And blah, 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 I looked blah, blah. at your website. It just Excellent. goes on, you know, and um, I've always got a lot of things going on. Now I've got bloody photo exhibitions going on. In London, a big one coming up. Um, I'm touring with my band for 38 shows. I saw so, your so, tour. Wow, yeah. And, and I'm raising three beautiful teenage daughters, <laughs> which is a nightmare. <laughs> I can imagine. I, could, I, I said, like, in my 50s, I couldn't imagine starting a family, so God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a delight. Good. You know, and, and I enjoy every minute of these things. But if there's something that I don't like anymore, I don't do it. What I found interesting about, I don't have the full box set yet, but I you know, found stuff on the web, and I've got your four, the four albums that you put out as the Rhythm Kings in my hands right now. I've had them for many years and enjoyed them and played them on the air. But what I, this is the only Stones cover melody? Yep. I thought um, so. <coughs> With Clapton and Georgie Fame, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's Love that Georgie, version. Georgie Fame and Beverly, my singer. Beverly Skeet. Doing it. It's great when they do it live because uh, they go... Uh, Melody and Georgie Fame goes Beverly ah! and Beverly goes Georgie, oh, cool. you know, and so they they make it more personal and it always goes down a storm. Um, once we started doing it, um, the Stones must have heard about it and they they put it back into their set ah! <laughs> for their next tour, which okay. was the two thousand. Uh, I mean, nine, the nineteen ninety five or whatever it was. So that that was great, and um, no, it was must have been later because we didn't start until later. 
but um, that was great to hear. We we do a few live, okay, uh, um, but not recorded. We do. I just want to make love to you. You know the Muddy Waters one, the right, fast up tempo Stones version, and. Um, Sometimes I get dragged into singing honky tonk women, <laughs> <laughs> which which I don't have the voice for, but it goes down a storm because the audience love it oh, and sure. my band play it great. Oh, you know, I am so, sure. So that's fun, but of course we haven't recorded them. We, uh, in regards to you, haven't recorded any original Stones musicians on any of your recordings either, but Sidemen. No, yes. Mick Taylor. Yeah, Sidemen. Yes, no, meaning Mick original. Mick Taylor did a little bit right on, on on a track. You know, he wasn't in good form. He had no guitar anymore. He'd sold all his guitars oh and God. amps. He didn't have any musical instruments. I had to hire stuff for him. Oh. And, he, and he really wasn't up to scratch, and it was a shame. I spent three days with him trying to get stuff out of him and help him because he was in a bad state. But since then, you know, he's got together, got himself together and all that, and he's doing things. He's got his own band now. Good. And sometimes when we're in Europe, especially Holland, he comes on stage and plays with us for two or three numbers. Very nice. So ah. he's pretty together, and he played on the Ian Stewart tribute album, right? And also on the live album, uh, on the live show we did in London with Charlie Watts and Ronnie Wood, right? And myself. So, so that was nice. But you also use Bobby Keys, American, yeah, briefly, uh, one of yeah. few Americans, right? Yeah, not many. <laughs> <laughs> Texas Bobby Keys, yeah. Yeah. But uh, well, he spent an awful lot uh, of time. And we used um, the Stones keyboard player as well, Nicky Hopkins. No, not Nicky. No? Well, we used Nicky, but no, the recent, uh, what's his name? Um, Chuck Level? Yeah, Chuck. Okay, he's a great player. Yeah, Chuck played on a few things in the early times. Okay, Chuck's a great player. Really, yeah, really, he's a really lovely great. man. Oh, yeah, no, I've, I've talked to you him. You know, so. I still stay in touch with those guys by email and all that. We mm-hmm. still, you know, still chat on email and, and, and stay friends and all that, which is nice. The new five-CD compilation is called Collector's Editions on Proper American here in the U.S., Records, and uh, I'll be looking forward to spinning this and giving it a lot of airtime and uh, writing a review and all that kind of good stuff. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, you're familiar with, speaking of Nicky Hopkins, there's a, there's a relatively new book out on Nicky. Oh, is that? Yeah, it's very nice. Actually, I'm going to be interviewing the, um, the author on Wednesday. Who is it? Graham, I don't have it in front of me, I'm sorry. Uh, I might know him. He, I'm calling him in the UK as well too, uh, but the book is well. Being, even if I don't know him, tell him thank you for doing it because Nicky Hopkins was a fantastic player. Tremendous. I mean, and he was a really good friend. He used to stay at my house when we were doing Exile on Main Street, and, wow. and I used to go and visit him on, in in uh, Mill Valley. You know, mm-hmm. when I was over there when he was home, and all that. And we were we were quite close. And so, um, and I still have a few tracks of him that we do put at. Uh, sort of bonus tracks on the albums, you know. Truly gifted man. Oh, one of the best. You know, he could play anything. Anything. And, and you know, I, let me tell you a brief story about Please. Nicky Hopkins. We were in Olympic Studios in the early 70s, I think it was. Me, Ian Stewart, nobody else had arrived. Nicky arrived. Ian Stewart said, you've got to listen to this album. I just got this album. You've got to listen to this first track. It's fantastic. And it was the Delaney and Bonnie first album. Wow. Whenever that was. <clears throat> I think it was early 70s. Wasn't early, it? Or maybe late 60s, but close. Stacks, yeah. Yeah, it could have been 69, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so he put it on the turntable in the, in the control room while we were waiting for the other people to come and played the first track. And Nicky Hopkins heard it, walked out into the studio, sat down at the piano and played the entire thing, note for note, Unbelievable. with all the breaks, the endings, the start, completely. Unbelievable. And Ian Stewart turned around to me and said, that's what I don't like about Nicky Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it's a wonderful story for sure. <laughs> Nicky, I mean, the, the, the fascinating thing to me, and I want to get into this with the author, but while I have you, because you spent quite a bit of time, I'm sure, with Nicky, especially with the Stones, and probably bouncing around through England in the early years too. I mean, I, it was fascinating me as a child, as a teenager, when, when I knew him, all, a lot of his work, Including the, the uh, what was it, the the Edward album that you guys did with Edward, yeah. uh, jamming with Edward, and and I said, you know, um, how did this guy wind up in like the San Francisco bands? It was just one of the mo- I would but never he, guess in that England, in a million years. Played, in England, he played on everybody's albums. That's he played true. with the Who, the Beatles, everyone used Nicky Hopkins when they could because he was just a stunning player. He could play all kinds of styles, 
and and really embellished tracks, you know. Yeah. Like nobody else at the time. There was nobody else like that. The only other person like that was Billy Preston. At That's the time, for sure. Speaking of melody, which we right? used and the Beatles used, of course, and, and uh, he was another gem. So there's only two guys that were Beatles, a Beatles alumni, and a uh, a Stones, right? Yeah, Nikki, yeah. Nikki and, and Billy Preston. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Bill, would you like to add anything? I, I, I'm pretty much got this covered. Well, I've got I've got another another one coming in in, in seven minutes. Uh, okay. On, on the hour. So. Um, if you know any talk. final thoughts you'd like to add? Uh, um. People ask me, uh, fans and that are always asking me, when am I going to come to America and, and, and are the band ever going to be playing in America? I get lots of emails from people who are fans of the Rhythm Kings in America. Okay. Unfortunate thing is I stopped flying in 1990. I read. And I've, uh, after 40 years, and uh, I've had no desire to do it again. And um, I just had to go to America twice for book signings. You know, I was I was contracted to do it. Okay. Which I did in the, the Blues early Odyssey. 2000s, and I did take the band over there briefly in 2001, okay. and we just did some gigs, but um, it wasn't a very good tour. We didn't, we weren't known over there, and it was a bit like the Stones' first tour, you know. Mm -hmm. We did well, but um, it wasn't the way it should have been. So I've never been back, and people say, "Are you going to come again?" You know, and, and my answer is always, you know, build the bridge or the tunnel, and I'll be there. There you go. Get the channel all the way to the USA, right? <laughs> <laughs> they could do it today. Well, they we, could did do it it. For, we did it across France. That was only 20-odd miles, but uh, yep. there we are. <laughs> all right. Can I ask you one favor? Yeah. Can you? I don't know if Carrie got this to you, but if not, I'll make it very simple. Can you say, this is Bill Wyman, and you are listening to WFDU? Yeah. yeah. We appreciate that. Okay. Hi, you're listening to Bill Wyman? No, sorry. I'll do it again. That's okay. Hi, this is... Hi, this is Bill Wyman, and you're listening to WFDU on the FM dial. There you go. Bill, it's a pleasure, man. It's a nice true pleasure. To you. Yeah, it was great. I hope I covered it well for you. This will be an article. We'll get it over to Carrie, Carrie Baker, who's been doing the publicist's work here. We hope you enjoy the readings of this, but I thoroughly enjoyed my time with you. You're a pleasant human being, and stay busy and stay young, my man. <laughs> it's the name I'll of the game. Try. We have to. we got no choice, right? <laughs> I'm not too far behind you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, thank Thanks. you. Thank you again. Nice talking to you. My pleasure. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.